afternoon, wherever you may be, and welcome to the Uber Freight Q2 2023 Market Update and Outlook. Um, we are glad that you are able to join us today. We have a lot of great information to share with you. And as always, we have our featured set of speakers, Matt Harding, the head of our 4PL Data and Anal Analytics, Ben Cubit, head of consulting, and Mazen Donoff, our senior applied scientist. We have a special, today is a special session um, as it's going to be Ben Cubitt's last session with us. He is retiring from the world of logistics and we wish him the best and we know that he's going to offer us a lot of great nuggets as, as we go out in this Q2 update. So with that, let's get started and I will turn it over to Mazen. Thank you and good morning everyone or good afternoon wherever you are. Uh, so I'll be go, uh, going over some macroeconomics and supply chain trends before I hand it over to Matt Harding and Ben. Uh, so a lot has happened in the last two years. We saw spot rates uh, decreasing by about 45% from the record high levels, uh, tracking spot rates uh, decreasing by 45% uh, from the levels we saw in January 2022. So this is probably the steepest decline in the history of spot rates. If we adjust these for inflation, they are about the lowest they have been in, in 10 years. Uh, so a lot of questions, we receive a lot of questions like, is this the bottom? Are we near the bottom? Uh, and one way we look at it is we is through our supply and demand indices, which I'm presenting here. The figure to the left shows our demand index in blue and our supply index in black. Uh, and they, this really tells us the, the, tell the story of what happened in the last two years. So COVID, COVID started, Demand surged. It remained above supply for two years. That coincided with uh, employee, driver employees getting laid off, uh, a reduction in supply, and that that persisted through the uh, throughout, throughout 2020 and 2021 until we got to 2022. And in 2022, we saw a huge increase in supply. Uh, driver hiring became much easier. Uh, getting access to equipment became easier as supply chain constraints started resolving. And at the same time, we were seeing that demand was getting weaker. Uh, at best, it was stagnating, but it was getting weaker, especially in the second half of, of 2022. Uh, that's when we saw the supply index running above the demand index uh, by levels that are not seen even in 2019. So this tells a story of how much the market is really over oversupplied. Uh, as of the most recent observation, uh, in, in, I think in March uh, of this index, it lags by a month. Uh, we believe that demand was about 1% to 2% lower than it was it used to be a year ago, while supply is about 6 or 7% higher than what it was a year ago. Uh, so there is a sizable gap between the, the supply and demand that is persistent. Uh, we have been seeing supply coming down slightly from before, but not at the rate that many expected it to be, like a, a bloodbath or a lot of carrier uh, failures or so on. We're not seeing that at scale yet. So there is a slight and slow reduction in supply uh, while demand remains stagnant. Uh, the difference between our supply and demand indices is historically correlated with the spot rates, like highly correlated with spot rates. Uh, and given that we're seeing this gap stabilizing and not increasing anymore, it might be an indicator that we are near the bottom, but what happens after the bottom, there's no indications that we'll see a surge in, in rates as well. So I'll go deeper into these uh, supply and demand indicators, starting with consumer spending. Uh, so this is the charts here show consumer spending on durable and non-durable goods. And what they're showing is that we're still uh, above the long-term trends, uh, considering the case of COVID hasn't happened at all. So we're still at relatively historically high levels of consumption, but they have been st stagnant or flat for a year. And they're approaching this long-term trend as time passes by. Uh, sp spending has been stronger than last year and especially driven by durable goods. So durable goods are things that we buy on a non-regular basis. Uh, think about the furniture or cars or uh, maybe appliances that last for a long time. Uh, and we're seeing surprisingly strong levels of spending there. These are goods that many people buy on loans and they finance them. This, this type of spending is very sensitive to economic downturns, but we're still seeing strong levels of spending on durable goods, which is a good sign for, for the economy. 
uh, spending on du non-durable goods has been slightly down year over year, uh, maybe like less than 0.5%, 0.2% probably down. Uh, and this is the type of spending that is not very sensitive to economic downturns. Think about food or clothing or things that we consume on a, on a daily basis. Uh, we should not expect this to, to go down significantly if, uh, if a recession happens. Uh, consumers are still buffered by savings, so they still have not run out of COVID savings that they accumulated during the pandemic. Uh, on the contrary, contrary, we're starting to see them rebuild their savings. So in the most recent observation, according to the BEA in March, the savings rate was 5.1%, indicating that consumers are saving 5.1% of their income, much better than a year ago where the savings rate was like 2 to 3%. Uh, but still below the pre-pandemic level, which is 7%. And why are, the, another reason why we're still seeing this strong level of spending is because real disposable incomes have been rising at a rate that is similar to inflation. So we saw a 4% increase in, in real incomes adjusted for inflation in the, in the last year. So this was more than enough to offset the effects of inflation. Uh, so the consumer is still strong, but this is not the full demand story. Uh, we, the, the other part of the story is the, what's happening to inventories. Uh, we all know what happened with the inventory glut that started around this time last year uh, and is persistent until today. So inventories are still higher, where, uh, higher than where we want them to be, whether we look at uh, retailers, wholesalers, or, or manufacturers. The good news is that in the past few months, we have seen retailers and wholesalers controlling their inventories. So when you look at the year-over-year -year growth, yes, it is it is shown in this figure. It ranges between like 5% to 20%, depending on what sector we're looking at. But when we look at the growth in the past three months or six months, there is barely any growth. A lot of these sectors have actually done a good job in destocking, <clears throat> where, the, where the amount of inventories has, has went down. Uh, one sector that we're seeing high inventory still is the motor vehicles and parts. And that's because there's a lot of pent up demand in this sector after two years of shortages. So this is still driving destocking. But if, if we remove this, if we consider the data excluding motor vehicles and parts, uh, it's, it's getting better. We're not there yet, but we have done a really, the economy as a whole has done a really good job in, in this destocking. The third sector we look at is the manufacturing sector, and that's where we were starting to see worrying signs. So this chart shows the ISM manufacturing uh, indices, the ISM PMI, uh, which is a combination of uh, several indices measuring production, backlogs, new orders, etc. Uh, and the way to interpret this index is that anything above 50 implies expansion, while anything below 50 implies contraction. And so far, we have seen contraction for six months in a row. So after, a, after two years of growth in the manufacturing sector, we have reached the peak and we have started, the, man, the manufacturing sector has started to decline since then. Uh, this is reflected in the PMI, in the production index, and all most of the other indices. Particularly, I like to look at backlogs and new orders as early indicators. Uh, we have seen these both below 50 for, for more, than, more than six months now. And this points that uh, this indicates that we expect more more uh, contraction in the months ahead. This is uh, consistent with data that we're seeing from the Federal Reserve, indicating that the manufacturing output, total manufacturing output in the U.S., is about one percent lower year over year. And then the fourth and final sector we look at on the on the demand side is uh, the housing sector. We also know what what happened to the housing sector since the since the rate since the rate hikes began last year. Uh, we saw building permits and uh, housing starts, which are shown in this figure, plummeting by about 30 percent. We hit more than 20, 20 to 30 percent lower year over year for both of these variables. But the good news there is that Q1 was better was slightly better than Q4, only slightly better. Uh, so we might have hit the bottom there. Uh, various indicators are also pointing to that we have hit the bottom, whether we look at new home sales, existing home sales, they're both on the rise. 
and the National Association of Home Builders sentiment, so it's like a sentiment, sentiment index of home builders, uh, has also been on the rise. Uh, I think the lowest observation was 35, and, and now it has climbed up to 45. This is also on a 50 scale cutoff. So anything below 50 implies lower, low sentiment. Anything above 50 indicates uh, positive sentiment. So we're still not in the territory of positive sentiment yet, but we're much, much better than where we used to be in, in Q4 of last year. Uh, so that's all on the demand side. Now switching gears to the supply side, uh, we look at tracking employment as one of the main indicators of, uh, of supply. This is data released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics on a monthly basis. Uh, and when we look at the headline tracking employment figure, it is at a record high level. So in, I think in April, we set a new record of number of payroll driver and payroll employees and in, in general freight tracking. But that doesn't tell a, the full story. Uh, in this chart, I'm breaking it by sector, which is also data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, and showing the year over year, quarter over quarter, and month over month growth. And what we can tell from this chart is that most of the growth in tracking employment has been driven by two sectors, local tracking, which, which does not necessarily include the class eight trucks or tractor trailers. It might be like single unit trucks or the delivery trucks. And the other sector is specialized tracking. Think about flatbed or uh, auto trucks or uh, maybe like tanker trucks, but not dry van trucks. So when we look at general freight tracking in the long distance truckload sector, uh, shown in the dark blue charts here, we're seeing a huge increase year over year because it was driven by the by 2022. But in the most recent months, we have seen a decline, a net decline in, in uh, employment in that sector. So this means that carriers are controlling their their headcount. They're even reducing their headcount. Uh, and this is expected to continue given that demand is stagnating and, uh, and contract rates are repriced lower. And the, we know that the BLS data does not capture everything. So we also look at data from the FMCSA on new tracking authorities and authority revocations. So this is supposed to capture a lot of the owner operator carriers that are not captured by the BLS data because they operate under a different uh, uh, company structure. So they're not payroll employees. So this tells a similar story. We have seen a huge increase in the number of carriers in the past uh, two years prior to 2022. Uh, so the, the chart in blue show, the line in blue shows the number of new authorities coming into the market. The line in black shows the number of authority revocations or the carriers exiting the market. And we have seen a, a significant rise in the number of revocations in the past few months, while the number of new carriers has been decreasing consistently. And the fact that the black line is running above the blue line indicates that there are more revocations than authorities. So the net number of carriers is decreasing month over month. Uh, and this is a trend that we also expect to to continue given the rising operating costs of carriers and the lower uh, spot rates. Uh, I, I would say that even though we saw like seven, six or seven months of declines in the net carrier population, uh, this totaled to about 10,000 carriers in total, but this is still much less than the amount of carriers that we have added in the prior two, two years, which is probably like close to 120,000 carriers. So the market remains very much oversupplied, even though it's moving in the in the right direction. Uh, and to put it all together, like what what is the effect? What is the outlook we see on in terms of demand, supply, and and rates? Uh, so in Q1, we saw uh, weaker than uh, like weaker than expected uh, performance in terms of rates. Uh, this was below what we expect in terms of seasonality. As an example, we didn't see that early produce season or sp spring produce season spike in spot volumes or rates, especially in March. So we expected to see March stronger than February, but on the contrary, we saw rates continue to decline and the market continues to soften. Uh, what, what are we expected for the second quarter? On the demand, we expect continued weakness in manufacturing as implied by the backlogs and new orders. Uh, we expect consumer spending to remain okay unless, as long as the unemployment levels remain healthy, 
as long as consumers are buffered by these savings, uh, we should expect consumers. We shouldn't expect any cliff or any collapse in consumer spending. Uh, so the worrying sector is more the manufacturing sector. Uh, on the supply outlook, we expect also to see continued decreases in uh, in both the number of authority uh, number of FMCSA authorities and payroll tracking employment. Uh, if you have looked at carrier various carrier earnings, uh, many have said that they they are seeing a net reduction reduction in capacity, but this is happening at a slower pace than what they originally expected. So what we're seeing is consistent, a very slow attrition process. Uh, but no, no quick or sharp correction. So what does this imply for rates? We might see some seasonal tightening in June driven by seasonal produce or beverages, but we don't, we don't expect major, major structural changes in supply and demand. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it to Matt to talk about some routing guide trends. All right, thanks, Mazen. Okay, so my focus is on the uh, on the transportation management system. So this data is derived off the what we call the TM platform, and so let's just, without further ado, dive right in. Um, in terms of route guide compliance, this data goes back just to give some more uh, clarity. This data goes back to 2019. Um, hundreds and hundreds of companies, billions and billions of uh, financial activity um, have occurred over this time period. Um, this is focusing on drive-in uh, as the major mode. Um, you can see, I, mean, I will add too, that the drive-in does track very closely to the temp control. And we'll look at some more detailed uh, difference across the modes towards the end. Um, in terms of route guide compliance, um, we're at a four-year high. Um, route guides are performing quite well. Um, the first tender accepts, again, are very high. Um, we were expecting, as Mazen said, to see a little um, a little bit of a change here in April. And I think the, the, the big call out here is when we look at the at these different metrics, including the trending inflation over primary, uh, as we get out of Q1 and into Q2, um, we're not seeing any dynamic changes that would be associated with um, more seasonal time of year, um, just given the gravity of um, the last couple of years and it's in, you know the impact of uh, you know, undersupply, oversupply, um, as you know, the economy unfolds. Uh, we're seeing less impact by some of the seasonal things that we would uh, typically expect to uh, Im impact the business. So um, on, on that uh, trending inflation over primary carrier, that is just a shipper, uh, same shipper, same lane. Um, when they don't get the primary carrier um, in the system, what's the, the combined sum delta to the rates that they're obtaining? And what this shows is that, you know, as those route guides perform really well, you don't get as much uh, uh, secondary or spot freight in your network. And as a result, um, if the route guide does fail, when it does, um, it does not introduce a lot of cost. So um, fairly uh, easy time for shippers. I would say when it comes to route guides right now, we'll talk a little bit about some of the macro trends, but um, how much you put into the spot market for whatever reason, you know, we're hearing a lot of discussion around um, seeing a lot of action and configuring that such that, you know, focus on where it makes sense in the network, um, you know, obviously high volume, highly critical lanes that go to your number one customer, probably not the greatest uh, primary decision there to go to all spot, but there are uh, always cases where um, it might make sense to start looking at the spot market as a, as a source of uh, capacity, particularly for infrequent or, um, you know, any high volatility where the, you know, the core carriers can't handle it. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, good, good rate um, response in the spot. As far as broker volumes, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag there. We're kind of where we were in 2019. That tends to oscillate um, more brokers as the route guide fails. So you can see obviously 2021 in there was the really, really tight part of the market. Um, spot market volume, um, we're seeing a reduction in that as well, back to where we were in 2019. Um, interestingly, the automated check call compliance, as we look at um, getting how you know what percent got two check calls on the on the uh, on the pickup and the delivery through automated means, which would be any of the third-party providers out there, or EDI. We're seeing uh, significantly improved check call compliance um, over prior years. Uh, next slide. The um, 
ordering lead times are are not quite you know there's the it's, we're not down to 2019 levels um but we're learning we're in that 8.5 to 9 uh day range from the original uh pickup to the the order lead time so you know just over a week in general um obviously results vary based on the need of the of the shipper um but those trends are more in line with um less in line with 2019 and more in line with the uh, 20, uh, 2022 there. Um, the accessorial spend is a percent of total spend is much lower. Um, you know, obviously um, accessorials play, play, can play a pretty big part, um, but we're seeing very low, um, very low accessorial impact. And then the must arrive by uh, date index, we're seeing some improvements in service uh, relative to, um, uh, you know, other years. In terms of the rate trends, um, we've, we've, we've isolated out, we used to put the manual loads up here, but because they, they span different processes across different accounts, we've separated the, um, the, the FAM loads, what we call auction loads, which are true spot. Typically, um, you, you put it out there, most of that freight gets uh, assigned within a day, sometimes it'll bleed over to the next day, but that's a um, uh, just using the, the opportunities in the market to find uh, lower cost. Um, you'll see those trends have dropped um, significantly below the black line there on the top, which is the, the rate of change to the contract market. Um, so pressure on all types of, of contract or spot rates. Um, obviously, the rate of reduction there. Um, interestingly, if you, if you do the math on the uptick and the downtick, um, the slope is essentially the same. And the, so if you're wondering what the rate of change is from all the recent bids and, and all of the better performing route guides on that contract trend, it's about one and a half to 2% per month. So while we, we had that level for well over two years, we're starting to see the same uh, rate of reduction, particularly with the band, a little less um, extreme on the reefer, but we're, you know, whenever that spot rate becomes uh, is uh, attractive below the contract, it just, there's a lot of pressure on the bids. We're seeing this across all modes. I would say the intermodal spot volumes are very, very uh, light. So that trend is can be a little bit noisier than than van or reefer. And flatbed always has seasonality in there. We would expect with the with the housing demand and, and pickup and construction and and the seasonal impact there to to, to change. But in all cases, uh, the spot market's offering benefits, and that's just indicative of to what Mazda had mentioned with the uh, kind of the flat demand. And, and the oversupply in the markets. Um, generally, the trends are positive. We would imagine um, shippers, um, you know, uh, having a fairly uh, easy time in their budget unless they got really aggressive on savings. Um, the first tender accept ratios, you can see they're all very, very much elevated. Um, and that's the, just a result of the route guides performing. And then to, to kind of close things up there on the bottom, we're seeing the, the cost of fuel per mile um, across all miles and all shipments uh, is dropping as well. A um, couple qualitative uh, charts here. In terms of procurement, we're hearing, um, we're seeing a record number of RFPs for Q1 um, at 75. So that's across all of Uber Freight um, 4PL work that we do here with the carrier uh, management team. Um, LTL customers are starting to bid a little bit more. That's typically a little bit um, delayed. So we're seeing about you know double of what we would, a little more than double what we, we would typically see. So lots of bidding activity across the board. Um, the trends we're seeing is that you know shippers like to focus on their incumbents. They can get more quality capacity. They, they tend to try to uh, thin the herd out a little bit and, and focus on core providers. Uh, we are seeing the net asset and brokers being entered strategically relative to um, freight that's difficult to forecast or low volumes, et cetera, or if they just have good flows and then can compete well with the asset side in terms of um, updates and communication service and, uh, and good capacity. Um, we're not seeing customers driving their um, incumbents or non-incumbents around LTL um, and looking at lower cost carriers, they're kind of holding their mix, uh, but certainly there's been an uptick in bidding there. Um, we're, carriers are bidding on a lot more lanes. I think that's just indicative of, of keeping the trucks moving and uh, maybe stretching their networks out a little bit more in terms of empty miles. Um, and that's just a result of the, of the environment we're in. Um, pretty, pretty significant war chest, I think, across the, 
the balance sheets have been built um, as a result of having really strong pricing over the last couple of years. Um, so we're not seeing the, the bankruptcies quite as fast as we, we would in other cycles, um, but we're certainly seeing, uh, we would expect empty miles to start increasing as carriers are really bidding on a lot more lanes and maybe not looking at their, their network as closely uh, as they were um, in the past. Um, savings we're seeing in the double digits to you know high double digits. Um, I think earlier uh, or later in last year they were it was you know in the 20 to 30 percent range. So we're starting to see the effect of year over year comps. Um, a lot of that really high spot rate kind of gets added into those savings estimates when you run a bid if you're doing it you know an annual comp. And we're starting to see the uh, the cooling effect of the market kind of weigh in on the numbers. Uh, we're expecting it to fall to 10 percent or below as those comps are compressing and then the LPTL savings are in the, in the mid single digits. Um, other focus on the shipper side, um, you know, kind of what we hear from a sort of, sort of consulting perspective is, you know, anytime a major mode as an input um, drops it, like truckload, it causes um, a lot, you know, a lot of renewed focus on how is the network set up, um, where are the weight breaks between modes, um, what is the, the benefit of uh, dedicated and private fleets. And there was a pretty large uptick in private fleets over the last couple of years as a result of COVID. And so being able to look at the trade-offs when those, you know, you have a large rate input changing um, has really kind of spurred up the, um, the sort of the consulting work we do and the focus on, do I have the right network? Um, seen a lot of focus on inbound logistics as well. There's been a lot of interest in, hey, we've been doing the outbound. Can we get the inbound under control as well? Um, and I think the biggest concern, at least the one that's been coming up, um, is if you're getting uh, significant savings from a carrier through a procurement event, um, how far is too far? Um, certainly, you don't want to be really effective from a procurement standpoint and drive the lowest rates. And if you do that in mass, it tends to build risk into the network. So I think shippers are really um, looking at this bottom a lot more acutely than they have in previous cycles. Um, just because of the nature of it's been so extreme on the sort of the back end of the of the COVID uh, peaks. Um, as a as a four four PL or a transportation management company, um, where we provide all the shared services for uh, you know all the work to do this and and manage uh, route guides on behalf of our customers and provide the technology. Um, one of the things that we've seen um, from every market swing is this idea that. Um, how do you plan for when the market changes? Um, so if you have improvements that are coming in and maybe you're taking uh, more spot than you normally would, or you're making adjustments to your network relative to capture that, that pricing, the key question is um, you know, not if the market changes, it's, it's what do you do when it changes and how long does it take? Um, in extreme examples, if you know, companies set up administrative processes where it might take four months to approve a contract rate or a rate change in the, in the route guide. Um, that's that's gonna set you back if the market swings the other way. Um, so I, what we like to advise our customers is to think of your plan B ahead of time, um, think of different scenarios and how that might play out because a lot of change and transformation is occurring right now, but that could be undone as the market uh, conditions change. We're not expecting big changes uh, in the short term, but there's been many cases where the, where, uh, you know, fate would have it, we we get a shock as a result of some geopolitical or uh, pandemic uh, resurgence or what have you. So um, make make your changes, but then uh, make sure you're, uh, there's gonna be, you know, you're planning for that rec inevitable recovery. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, intelligence also on the market conditions. We are certainly not alone in presenting what we're seeing from our platform and from an economic perspective, it seems like the market is saturated uh, with this information. and. What that means is that all the parties in the supply chain um, have their strategies built on these inputs now that are, are happening faster. Um, there's getting more clarity. I can you know, think back to 20 years ago, the types of things we know now on a week to week basis um, were unimaginable. Um, you'd have to wait months, a month or months on economic data. And um, to a large extent, we're seeing that real time. So just keep that in mind as well that you know, it's our job to report on what we see. We realize that um, from carriers to third parties out there all across the board, um, there's there's a huge demand for that. And what that means is that the extreme um, change, the volatility, the frequency in which that volatility impacts our business, is gonna make our jobs a little bit more challenging. So 
Uh, with that, um, Ben, it's been an honor. Um, take us home. Great, Matt. Appreciate that. Um, yep. So um, if we can go to the next slide. So as, as Mazen and Matt have laid out, <clears throat> and as these charts show, uh, we kind of really do have a good understanding of where we are. You look at PMI, if you look at the uh, FTR's active truck utilization, that's that bottom slide on the left. Look at our spot rate index starting last year that we publish every week. Um, all of it's fallen sharply uh, to the right and down and um, all tells the same story, right? And if you look at our, our spot rate index where we've been for the last you know, 12, 14 weeks, we're kind of bumping along the bottom. So if this market update were part of a movie or if you were streaming a show on your couch, this would be a great time to go get popcorn, take a break, uh, reload your beverage, and you don't even need to rush back to your seat probably because uh, you kind of know what's gonna happen in the movie. But you do want to get back in your seat at some point because, um, you know, is the uh, ship going to hit an iceberg? Is it going to be a big explosion? Uh, we know we know something's probably going to happen to make the uh, movie get more interesting in the coming parts. And I think what we're also uh, beginning to form a consensus around industry analysts, and I think the industry overall, that part that's uh, circled, uh, you know, I love the uh, FTR active truck utilization when we were at 98 and 100 percent and then every truck had a home every day and it was difficult to get trucks. Now we've fallen well below uh, the 10 year average, below 92 percent truck utilization. So there's much greater avail availability. And in FTR's most recent report, they said that the uh, active truck utilization might not exceed the 10 year average of 92 percent until 2025. Right. So. Uh, we may be in for this bumping along the bottom uh, with a slow recovery for an extended period. And so, you know, what's going to change? We highlighted this last quarter, uh, but one of two things is going to change this market, either uh, demand or supply. And either um, the Fed's going to stick their soft landing and demand's going to increase, uh, though that looks like um, the Fed is really committed to uh, to to you know, battling the consumer and battling the economy, or we're going to have, um, uh, you know, supply disruptions because rates are going to get so low. Uh, we've seen some, um, some, um, you know, carrier bankruptcies. We see some evidence of drivers leaving the industry, uh, but we still have plenty enough capacity. And as Mazen and, and Matt pointed out, we have excess capacity to meet the current demand level. So one of those two things is gonna to have to change and we're all gonna stay glued to see what that is. So we can go to the next one. So we, we've been doing a um, survey of our carrier base uh, for a number of years. And so what do we see? What does that tell us? You know, Mazen talked about driver count. What we see for our asset-based carriers um, uh, is that the majority have grown their fleets or stayed the same. Very few fleets have decreased and actually the average increase has been about 7%. So carriers have been able to go out and find drivers and as they get new equipment in, seat those. And you can see by the seated percent, um, you know, we hit a real trough uh, as, you know, in 2021, 85%, very low seated percent, a lot of uh, trucks up against the fence. Uh, we recovered when we did the survey last summer. Uh, we were at about 93%, so a high seated percentage. Uh, you know, you, you don't ever want to be 100% because you need some trucks available for training, new drivers, et cetera, maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we've seen a little bit of a dip, still high, still a high seated percentage. Uh, is that an early sign uh, that maybe uh, there's, there's, you know, drivers leaving the industry? We certainly see that, and you can imagine it. So if we go to the next part of the survey, if we go to the next slide, you know, I thought this part was very interesting. So we talked to carriers about where do you see network efficiency and uh, how are you doing? Why are drivers leaving uh, your, your, your network or the industry? And uh, there's a lot of reasons there, you know, worker shortage, et cetera, et cetera, uh, some delays, but it's really, you know, what's made networks more inefficient is that carriers see a decrease in freight volume. So that means they're increasing their deadhead. Uh, they don't have 
some of the comments we didn't include, but they don't have a favorable backhaul. They may have to go further to find a backhaul. Uh, they may have to deadhead or definitely are deadheading further. So while there's a big focus on sustainability by shippers, more interest than ever, freight networks have actually got less efficient. So what does that mean to drivers and what does that mean to carriers? If you look at that second bullet below, um, there's a lot of reasons why uh, drivers leave the industry. Lifestyle is still the biggest, wanting to be home more. But the second biggest that we saw consistency in the survey was not enough miles and freight for drivers. And that's really the driving, um, if you really wanna know what's going on with carriers right now and what's top of mind for carriers, it's getting enough miles to keep their drivers happy because they know this market's gonna turn at some point, you know, uh, are we bumping along the bottom and how long we bump along the bottom, we don't know, but they have to have drivers. And uh, when the market does turn and volume does increase, the, the critical resource of course is, is drivers. And so um, even though rates are really depressed and carriers, uh, they've kind of accepted that. And really the battle now for carriers is to keep as many miles as they can in the network, even at these deflated rates. And we've all seen carriers be more aggressive about wanting to see new opportunities, wanting to retain freight. And that's really what it's all about because at this point, um, you know, if they don't keep enough freight in their networks, even at low rates, they're going to lose that critical resource, the drivers. So the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was um, sustainability. Um, we've seen more interest among our shippers. Uh, sustainability is again top of mind. Uh, what we do see there, and we see this really consistently, is that shippers are really focused on tracking uh, green, tracking carbon initiatives, capturing things they're already doing, uh, loading trucks fuller again, uh, maybe doing uh, putting more backhauls in their fleet. So there's a lot of effort to get better at capturing green savings and to capture how they're doing. There's not as, to be honest, there's not as many active initiatives. So while shippers are interested in it, they haven't translated that. And then when we looked at carriers from our care survey for the first time, we asked, you know, what are you doing about green? What are your sustainability initiatives? And the overwhelming response we got back was um, what we're really doing is uh, we're looking to drive the most, you know, the newest, most up-to-date equipment that's the most efficient. Uh, we're trying to do some traditional smart way things around uh, APUs and some other things. Uh, we're looking at tire uh, efficiency. So really traditional um, approaches. Uh, but we did see some fleets do have active or planned initiatives by the minority. Um, we do see some evidence of EVs starting uh, CNG uh, fleets, but it's still a real uh, small percentage of the carriers. There's more looking at it, but when you look at some of the folks who said they didn't have active initiatives, and again, this would be um, a significant part of the carrier base, um, they're looking at electronic opportunities but it's not cost effective for their networks right now. And we're looking um, at different things, but it's not efficient for uh, our over the road long haul drivers. You know, there's challenges with enough uh, places to charge the vehicles. There's payload issues. Uh, there's just the cost of the equipment, um, harder to find uh, backhauls and, and link those up. Sometimes uh, we have a number of EV pilots going with shippers and uh, Uber certainly is getting a lot of learnings and sharing those with our shippers. But I think we're at an interesting point. So when you look at uh, EV particularly, uh, there's been a lot of hearings recently as, as not just California, but uh, the national, uh, you know, the government looking at, you know, what do we wanna do with mandates for EV vehicles? We're at an interesting point right now. Um, and, and as um, Jed Mandel, the president of the Truck and Engine Manufacturers Association, said it uh, one of those hearings in the last week or two, uh, we really cannot afford a scenario where manufacturers must sell zero emission vehicles, but fleets won't purchase them because there's not the infrastructure in place to operate them. That's a recipe for disaster. So we all wanna see more EVs, we all wanna see a more efficient network, uh, but there's still a disconnect between that aspiration and the actual uh, reality on the street. So we'll all see how that, how that plays out. Um, 
So uh, with that, um, I, I think the last thing I would share is just before we leave the shipper perspe perspective, um, since we are in such a great market, some of the most interesting conversations we've had recently with shippers have been, if we're buying at the bottom of the market, how do we hedge that potential risk? And then there's more pressure from ever. We see, especially our large shippers, as they're doing bids, um, their C team, their EVPs, have to review the decisions they're making on that bid. So, um, you know, the waterfall of why I put this constraint on, why I put this constraint on, all those constraints, uh, reducing the potential savings in a bid, uh, we see more review ever. And what we're also seeing, and I think this is something that shippers need to be to pay attention to, is the viability of their carriers. You know, really understand more uh, when you've got a, a strong percentage of your freight uh, with a carrier or when it's a smaller carrier who may not have the financial uh, backing of some of the large carriers. As if this continues to be an extended tough market, how do you make sure that those carriers are still financially viable, uh, that you don't have risk? We think that's going to be one of the, the major challenges and uh, opportunities for shippers as we continue this market. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Carmen and we'll answer some Q&A. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate that. Um, ben, Matt, and Mazen, as always, thank you for your insight. Okay, we do have the Q&A um, session open. So if you have any questions, go ahead and plug them into the to the Q&A module on your screen, and those will pop up and we'll get those asked. We've got a couple of questions that have been submitted earlier, and I think we touched on all of these topics, but I'm gonna go ahead and circle back to them just to see if there's any other deeper comments um, that, that you guys want to make. Mazen, the first one, um, the first question is just around some of the, the driver availability. We talked about how we, we, we seem to have um, a surplus of, of drivers and carriers in the market right now for the type of market that we're seeing. Um, you showed in one, in one of your charts some of the differences between you know the truck load and, and less than truck load um, availability. Any thoughts there on how that relates also with bulk? Are we seeing the same trends there um, on driver availability? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, we bulk is not one of the categories that is reported by the BLS survey. So they it's not a specific category we can look at. It is part of the specialized uh, for, uh, employment uh, statistic. That includes, in addition to bulk, it might include uh, auto trucks, uh, flatbeds, and, and all of that. Uh, and we are, we are seeing growth there because we didn't see growth at the same rate that we saw last year. Uh, so last year, we were seeing very, very fast growth in truckload and, uh, and reefer uh, employment. And that resulted in the sharper uh, rate drops in these two sectors. Uh, we did not see as, as sharp as an increase in the specialized uh, trucking sector. Uh, this year, however, we we're seeing that truckload and reefer employment are getting lower. Uh, probably because uh, rates are, are much lower. Uh, but if you look at the specialized sector, we are still adding adding capacity there. Uh, that might or might not uh, correspond specifically to bulk, but we know that that category includes bulk and other categories as well, other trailer types. Great. Thanks, Mazen. Appreciate that. Um, Matt, we have a couple questions on fuel prices. Um, we've got, you know, fuel fuel prices continue to decline. Do you think that will be an ongoing trend of summer approaches? I know there's all, also the, you know, we know what, we, we have the crystal ball. We can't see too far into the future if there are weather events and things like that, but just general thoughts on fuel pricing. Yeah, it's always been a difficult market to track. Um, uh, what's made it more difficult recently for people that, that are in that industry sector is that the strategic reserve actions um, have a uh, sort of, sort of a, um, an effect on the ability to kind of look at things historically that were helpful for that. So um, generally speaking, uh, the economy, you know, as the interest rates go up and we look at um, credit and other areas of the economy slow, um, you know, fuels fuels um, uh, going to be less in, less in demand. But 
I don't, I just, I don't know, I don't know where I would go to, um, to, to forecast that. I know the EIA.gov is a good source. And then uh, Philip K. Verlegger is the, uh, he's been looking at oil markets since the 70s. Um, he has a lot of blogs and good information there. So generally when I get those questions, I kind of point to those experts. Um, I think certainly from the standpoint of what we do as a business, um, fuel is a very critical and important input. So, you know, make sure you've got a, a, a good fuel program. Um, I would stay uh, away from percentage-based uh, fuel programs for, for, you know, sort of truckload intermodal. Um, LTL, obviously, there's a lot of percentage fuel programs there. Um, you know, and benchmark your fuel relative to your line haul. Um, you have to add those two to kind of really get a sense of, of if you're overpaying or not. Um, and, you know, try to be efficient. I mean, I, a lot of the sustainability work out there, I think, is, is 100% aligned with uh, using less to get more, right? Less miles and less impact. So from a strategy and fuel, you know, uh, watch it and um, always be mindful that your network configuration, uh, you know, I can go back to 2008 when fuel spiked and we did a lot of intermodal work at that time to uh, look at feasibility and comparability and spurs and hubs and all of that. So. Um, so I don't, it doesn't seem like there's anything in the future here that's going to cause anything to cause a, a very significant impact, but, but just be mindful that it can change quickly and then think about your network from the standpoint of uh, what we can do to help analyze it and then more importantly, configure it for whatever scenario unfolds. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Ben, let's go to you. We've got a question here on sustainability um, and small fleets. Any thoughts or tips on what small fleets can do to navigate the current market to ensure long-term sustainability? Yeah, Carmen, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think people need to be talking to shippers. You know, we we do a lot of bids and, and it's, it's difficult for, um, for shippers sometimes to just manage a bid. There's so much work uh, involved with it that I think carriers have to really be talking with the shippers, making sure that they understand what's important about their network. You know, I've really enjoyed doing these market updates uh, for the past 10 plus years. And I really appreciate all of our shipper carrier partners um, who have let me vet ideas with them, give me their input. And um, I think as an industry, there's still a lot more we can do. And I think for small carriers and, and carriers in general, it can be such a transactional relationship. And I think as an industry, uh, there's a lot more we can do to understand what drives empty miles, what, um, and that, you know, you look at the sustainability of the carrier, uh, they could mean that question both ways, the green sustainability and the sustainability to just keep the doors open. And I, I think we have a, a long way to go to, to share more data. You know, we as an industry measure the heck out of the carriers and we tell them when they don't do things we expect them to do, uh, we don't measure, measure the shipper behavior as much. You know, as a shipper, I've always been able to tender a load whenever I want, irrespective of, you know, the efficiency that that may drive for the carrier. And certainly some shippers are paying attention to that. But I, I think I think carriers, and this is something I, I've said consistently over the years, talking to ADA and others, is I think carriers have to be more vocal and they have to share more data with shippers and say, this is what's important to my network. This is what would help me and you. This would make me more efficient, would make the supply chain more efficient, would help us keep drivers in the industry. And I just think there's a ton of work uh, that can and should be done in that area. But I, I think it starts with carriers, small carriers, any size carrier having a better dialogue with the shipper with the 3PL and bringing data to that discussion. Great, thanks Ben, appreciate that. Mazen, gonna come back to you here for this question. There's a question on kind of uh, re regular reports that we put out. I know you have your quarterly freight economist, or excuse me, monthly freight economist that goes out. Um, do we have anything around sustainability or does your report include anything around sustainability that we send out? Yeah, thank you. So we, we try to include some sustainability uh, updates in that report, but it's not on a regular basis. Uh, so that report comes out on a monthly basis and covers mostly the macroeconomic trends uh, in terms of supply and demand drivers of freight. 
we try to include some sustainability updates, but it's not a regular thing in the report. Uh, we have also like a lot of uh, irregular po blog posts on sustainability, but at this point, nothing quarterly or nothing at a regular basis. Okay, thank you. I know we, we do have a sustainability team at Uber Freight that's looking at what we can start building out and, and, and become more, um, more proactive with, so stay tuned for some of that as well. Um, Matt, back to you for this question. Um, more and more shippers seem to indicate the freight market won't turn around at all in 2023. Do you agree or disagree? And do you agree or disagree that any improvement in truckload and intermodal rates, that none of that will happen until 2024 and why? Well, I, everyone should know by now my uh, my pension for forecasting. Um, I, I think I think the uh, yeah <laughs> I think the key is when I look back over the years. Um, and this is why we sort of hammer the the, the, the re, redesign and the improvement and you know the points of being um, having optionality. It's just so key. Um, it, I, I would never make a bet based on my experience of what would happen or what will happen. I, I think you have to be prepared for what could happen. And that's just, that's the approach that's tried and true. Um, Mazin's work um, on the economy and the sort of the macro trends, I think really paints a very clear picture about um, kind of what we're looking at. I think all of us as professionals are in tune with um, things that happen at the Fed, what's happening from a general business perspective. All of us have competitors in our own in our own industries. And, um, you know, how that factors into trucking, you know, we just try to fill that, that, um, that white space with what we're seeing in our business to kind of help you all. Um, th there's really nothing coming in, in 2023 that, um, this point would uh, give me pause, but then again, um, in our next quarterly update, we could be talking about something completely different. And if you go back through time, um, I, and I'll just use the current situation as an example. Think of predicting this drop in rates, um, you know, where we see a 30% discount on average for auction loads relative to contract. Um, if I told you a year ago, I'm gonna predict that I think there would be some some head scratching is like, well, where is that coming from? So we're actually in a scenario that I believe is one that um, all the pundits missed. Um, and and so that's just sort of part and parcel to the to the industry. So I, I agree with Mazin's take. I mean, we obviously discuss a lot, a lot of those aspects relative to what are we seeing on the platform? What are we seeing broad, more broadly in the economy? Um, and they line up pretty well, um, but it really kind of just tells us where we are and where we think we're gonna be in the near near three to six months is about as far out as I would go. Beyond that, it's anyone's bet. Hey Matt, f quick follow on to that, um, just kind of with the state of, of what the market is. Are we seeing, and, and Ben Mazin for you too, are we seeing shippers try to extend terms of their contracts in, in, bid, in recent bids? trying to push from 12 to 18 months. So have you guys, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Um, I'm not hearing that too much. It does come up and it usually comes from finance. Like like the, the, yeah. oftentimes uh, transportation providers get lumped in into the general vendor strategy. Um, historically, you can do that. Um, it's not, you know, it's obviously uh, contract terms are, you know, you, you can accept them or not. You can change them if, if you want. But the reality is, um, there's really nothing binding in the relationship between a shipper and a carrier. Um, hence the need for um, communication, collaboration, um, you know, the need for as much transparency as each side can, can, can offer um, to kind of forge network uh, synergy, if you will. Um, but the idea that um, I, think, I think the soft markets, prolonged soft markets um, raise a whole host of things that um, you know, whether it's payment terms like being extended um, or the contract um, or days payable, you know, or the, um, yeah, um, all of that finance stuff gets looked at. Sometimes uh, fuel's changed um, and, and it all benefits the shipper, but in reality, you're competing in the same market with other shippers. And um, I, I think the more advantage that you take and the more, the more differentiation that you make as a shipper, um, it sort of tees you up for when the when the recovery comes back and there's and there's uh, less capacity. 
um, you're sort of setting yourself up to, to not be able to maintain that. So um, yeah. we don't we don't really advise it, but you know some companies do it, and you know it's their it's their right to do, make that choice. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left here, and I, I want to call out just a couple of housekeeping things. We will be sending out the presentation and the recording to everybody who joined us, so you will get that after after the um, call today. Um, with just a few minutes left, um, Ben, I'm going to ask you to, to come back on camera, and if you want to to leave us with any parting words, as as again, this is your last session and your last quarterly update with us. Um, thanks, Carmen. No, I uh, I. Uh... You know, I, I, I think it's been amazing times. You know, we, we do these market updates, and I can tell you, you know, they, the last two or three years, they, they've been more must-see TV and, uh, you know, more market dynamics that we've all lived through. I, I think, you know, the work that data scientists like Matt and his team do, we, we know more about the market. You know, Matt and I talk about this a lot. You know, we, we have a better feel for the market, certainly where it is and where it's going to be near-term. I think is an industry than we've ever had. Um, I, I think, um, you know, one of the things I've been pleased to see is even though we are in a very soft market, I think that, you know, most of our uh, shippers TM customers are still as committed to uh, trying to make their carriers, their networks more efficient, trying to be carrier friendly, uh, trying to do things to help keep drivers in the industry. Um, as we also talk about a lot, this will turn um, and, um, you know, supply chain folks will keep finding solutions. Um, it's been a great, you know, 30 years, like everybody, I, I got into this accidentally. I didn't know how to spell uh, transportation or freight back in the day uh, when I kind of came into it uh, from a completely different angle. Uh, but it's been a great run. And, you know, so, so many of us in the industry now have uh, kids, kids' friends coming in the industry. I hear that all the time, and I can you continue to think supply chain is one of the more exciting, dynamic careers there are out there. So uh, Matt and Mazen will keep you informed, and Carmen, you'll keep them on track. So I appreciate it. Appreciate uh, you know a lot of feedback. I, I will just say, you know, as we do these market updates, it's a very collaborative part, and, and we learn so much from our customers and carrier partners that we try to bring to this. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Um, we appreciate your contributions and everything you've done for us over the past years. And we wish you nothing but the best in your relaxation and retirement. <laughs> Matt Maz, and thank you all. Thank you everybody for joining us. And we will see you all next quarter. Take care and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.